So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to say that <laughs> we, we, we are all here thanks to their good work. So I think that's uh, really a fantastic effort. And I also actually think it fits well with the theme of this panel, which is EU integration. This is a sign of very nice collaboration between Sweden, who is one of Ukraine's partners for EU integration. Um, we actually went, came here last year in, in uh, June to discuss the DCFDA. Uh, now Ukraine is moving in that direction. I think this panel, I'm, I'm looking really for discussions about how is now this EU integration going to happen? How do we make sure it benefits as many people as possible in Ukraine? Uh, what is it that the outside world and the EU and Sweden and other partners can do? What, what is it that you have to do yourself? Um, and I'm, I'm extremely honored and happy that we have such a distinguished panel to, to discuss these issues. Um, I will not spend too many minutes introducing you at length, but I, I, I just want to mention that we have Aliena Tserkal, uh, Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs, and apologies if I can't pronounce names correctly. Uh, we have Alexei Pavlenko, who is the Minister for Agriculture, or Agrarian Policy and Food, as it's called, actually. We have Miklas Jurinda, a uh, well-known politician from Slovakia. Um, he will have to leave us at uh, 3.30, so you have to uh, apologize, uh, give him sort of the free, free exit so he actually catches his plane. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Jan Sveiner, a uh, professor of economics in the US, but also founder of Sergi in, in Prague. Zasnovnik um, Sergi I in Prague. Taras, Taras Kashka. Kashka. Um, he's the Vin. vice chair of the American Chamber of Commerce. Stupnik, and we have Veronica uh, uh, Mosha, uh, researcher here in Ukraine. So I think this really sets us up for a very nice discussion about EU integration. And I'm not going to steal any more time from the panelists. Я хотів би передати слово заступнику міністру. Прошу Олена. Може, може дати, може ми їх привітаємо з дуже теплими аплодисментами. Дякую і дякую за можливість виступити перед вами. І я не готувала промов, тому що я гадаю, що набагато важливіше провести дискусію, ніж виголошувати промови. Але я хотіла б Will have first Ukraine-EU summit. This is the highest political meeting, and uh, we do expect that it will be fruitful and to bring some results. Of course, we are aware about what kind of results we are waiting for, and uh, you might know that we are also in the process of the discussions how the DCFTA should be implemented. We will present tomorrow the results of the implementation of the whole association agreement and the CFTA already as a part of this agreement. We didn't uh, lose our times and we spent quite a number of efforts with a view to prepare the country for the implementation of the DCFTA. And I am sure that the Minister of Agriculture will present you more full picture about our readiness to implement the CFTA in a part of sanitary and phytosanitary issues. I will not touch a lot concerning the other issues of the DCFTA. However, I must say that we made a significant progress in such areas as elimination of technical barriers to trade in customs facilitation, as well as State aid preparation, we adopted uh, uh, necessary legislation. We also adopted all necessary legislation in the field of the public procurement. And actually, Russian Federation accused us already in a gradual approximation of Ukrainian legislation. And I do think that this is a quite a positive sign. <laughs> <laughs> it means that we did not lose our time that we made all necessary efforts with a view to implement the agreement. 
However, we did it not in the framework of the DCFT implementation. We did it because we had such an obligation and we still have such an obligation in according to the partnership and cooperation agreement. There is an Article 51 which clearly stated that Ukraine should take all necessary efforts with a view to approximate its legislation in the 16 spheres. And we tried to explain this to Russians, that we took this obligation years ago, and we continue our work. Last week we had uh, a quite extensive discussion in Brussels with Russians and with the European Union concerning the Russians' concerns, which they have because of the DCFT implementation. We spent two days with a view to find practical solutions on Russian concerns. Uh, it was quite obvious that most of their concerns laid down in the field of bilateral relations and implementation of CIS-FTA agreement. However, nevertheless, Russians again put forward the issue of postponement or suspension of the agreement for one more year. Because they understood clearly that that's the only instrument how they can put pressure on us and on the European Union. And then on this matter, we were absolutely clear that we have no intention to further postpone the implementation of the DCFTA. Not we, neither European Union. We were absolutely clear that we don't see any ground for further postponement. And I would like to say this quite straight, because we do understand that the business have to be ready to start the implementation of the DCFTA and make clear their plans for future. On this, I will pass the floor to another participant, because I know that we have a quite tight agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will continue the discussion with the Minister for Agriculture, may I call it yeah. that? But yeah, it's not yeah. quite right. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for attention and for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to add that uh, last year became very important for us in terms of foreign trade, especially in European Union foreign trade. In agribusiness, total size, total volume is around 5 billion US dollars in only, only in agribusiness, which is 5% five five higher than it was previous year. And uh, comparing just to uh, uh, custom unions, it's 2.8 billion only. It's nearly twice less. Because we used to think about that Russia and Belarus and Kazakhstan are the main market for us. It's not for agribusiness, unfortunately, it's not. Or luckily, it's not. Because when we have declined by 31% in those markets, we compensated this decline by European Union growth, plus 4% by Asian countries. It's now currently 6.6 .6 billion US dollars with 10% increase year to year. And uh, it shows that at this moment, uh, opening European Union market for new products is crucial for agribusiness. Last year, we managed to open, for example, for chicken meat. And uh, just for example, we completely used the quotas for corn, for uh, uh, tomatoes, for juices, for honey, and for uh, chicken. It's 100% use. Okay, so not so, and some of the quotas has been used only in one month, completely. I can give you just an example. As of 21st of uh, April this year, so we also already used the quotas for honey, <laughs> also for corn, and also for juices as well. And currently we're using quotas for chicken. And we now started not so easy process. We're now talking with the Ministry of Economy. We launched the group how to revive the quotas and go through not popular political decision to increase the quotas because we did our first step when we, for certain products, we matching and managing to match European standards of quality and opening the market. And next step, as we're saying to our European partners, okay, thank you very much for giving us financial support, technical support, because at this moment we have 24 different working groups together with European Commission involving USAID, FAO, IFC, World Bank, USAID, but the main core is our European Commission experts working on uh, land reforms, working on food safety, it's quite a big extensive group, working on forestry, fishery, state-owned enterprises, working also on the corporate governance and on, on standards. And 
actually the issue for opening for new product is one issue. So this year we would like to open European market for milk and dairy. We plan to do currently more than 10 different enterprises that are passing through procedures of uh, different types of veterinarians, phytosanitarian, due to HASP, HASP standards. And we plan to open this year milk uh, market for Europe. Okay, we do understand that quotas are very, very, very also low. And, but we do it first of all to show that we're able to make milk based by European standards. We're increasing the quality of internal production, but we're also giving us having opportunity to have European certificate. It opens for us opportunity for China, for Asian markets, for African markets as well. So we do understand the quotas are low, but it gives us additional export opportunities. The same issue, for example, just as an example, you mentioned that we managed to pass its recent information five days, days ago. Our sanitarian, Hita sanitarian uh, joint experts of European Union and Ukraine, they managed to pass all the procedures for the ex-expert. So we're actually also now opening some markets for X currently for this year. It's also a very big step forward. Uh, that also would like to mention that we launched and last week we did so-called agrarian dialogue. This was 10th agrarian dialogue, this is first agrarian dialogue after signing association agreement last year. And one of the main focus of this agrarian dialogue was how to go deeper within synchronizing legislation procedures within European Union. We have now to pass and uh, synchronize more than 50 different laws, more than, uh, and being able to, to, uh, to match 40 different European Commission directives. And one of the main roles, uh, what we're doing, we're doing now for so-called deregulation. We managed to pass together with the working group and have to cancel, we have canceled 14 different licenses, six different certificates, more than, more than, more than 50 changes in normatives and acts of legislation, how to simplify the business. It's also done together with our European experts. We do understand that for, for agrarian business, we have a tough period because we cannot give some such a subsidies as we gave before, and we cannot propose the same subsidies as for European Union. Average subsidy in European Union per hectare is 230 euro per hectare. In Ukraine, currently, we have 30 euro per hectare. It's it's very, very big difference. But we show to the investors and to our business that we're trying to simplify business as much as possible. With the land reform, okay, guys, minimum seven years lease and simplified procedure for registration. We're also now launching big debates and discussions with different platforms, or also in Verkhovna Rada, questions about about future of the land market. It's also a big issue because I don't understand big pluses as land would be the commodity, but it's also, also a lot of pros and cons is such a decision, and also technical decisions. You know that cadastrum now only 5% complete, and also the issue of regulation, how if it's possible to sell the market, the land, it's also a big issue. And valuation of the land, interization of the land, and it's a huge pile of issues for which we have to also prepare together with different ministries and then to say that we are ready, for example, to discuss that land is the commodity, which also actually is a question from European Union, because European Union is saying us, give us clear, transparent vision how you see the land market. And our clear, transparent answer is, guys, we are now proposing at this moment minimum seven years lease for the land. We pass the law, and this is the first step which gives for the investors the guarantee that they can uh, work minimum for seven years, planning the crop rotation, planning the investments in the uh, harvesters, in the cedars, in the, also in the, in the elevators, also big plus. So for us, European Union became very strategic market, and we are not only see the strategic market for trade business, we are sharing the values with European Union, we are sharing the business practices, and we do really a lot of job now. Uh, only in the last three months, it's more than 186 different meetings for the working group with the European Commission since these 24 different groups has been done. To see the strategy, how we see agrarian markets for 2020, but also to do current job at this moment in terms of synchronizing legislation and practices, the best practices. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll get a little bit of experience from someone who's actually been through the EU integration process. So please. Thank you very much, dear friends, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I will speak more politically and uh, my contribution will come more from practice than from theory because I believe that you have many guests 
uh, well, not only theoretically, but also technically equipped. And uh, at, as uh, it was already rightly pointed out or mentioned, uh, for Slovakia or for the politicians from Slovakia, uh, the case of Ukraine is something like déjà vu. Speaking about DC, uh, DC FTA or associating uh, agreement, uh, we should speak about the substance, how to modernize the country, how to prepare Ukraine to join the EU at the end of the day. And uh, in this regard, I would like not only to share our own experience from the way of Slovakia to the EU, uh, but also to encourage you to move a lot. Because uh, we remember something in Ukraine, and now everybody knows that there is a real chance to, to, to modernize the country, to promote reforms, real changes, and to prepare the country for economic competition, for the situation in which Ukraine will operate as a full-fledged member of the EU one day. Uh, I feel, I would say, a realistic optimism. Why? Because my home in 1998 was politically isolated and economically ruined. Professor Schweiner remembers very well. Uh, we had also our small Yanukovych in Slovakia, my predecessor, not completely democrat. Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO being uh, uh, these three countries, our neighbors, were invited in 1997 to negotiate their EU membership. Slovakia was completely excluded because of lack of democracy and because uh, lack of political will to promote reforms. Madeleine Albright labeled Slovakia in summer 1998 as a black hole of Europe. <laughs> Summer 1998. But summer or, or March 2004, Slovakia joined both NATO and the European Union. And the same press in the United States, but also in Paris, also in Germany, described Slovakia as an economic tiger of Europe. It was something unbelievable for me. And if I have a look at Slovakia, and from, uh, from Kiev, it is very interesting to have a look at Bratislava or Slovakia. If I can compare my home today with Slovakia in 1998, I see two completely different countries. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, it works. If there is a real political will, a real and strong political determination. I believe that uh, you will not be frustrated if I will pick up another country from the Balkans. Do you remember the situation between Serbia and uh, Kosovo or Croatia only several years ago? How many people believed five years ago that Serbia in 2015 will begin its negotiations with the European Union. So it is possible. So the question, a logical question for, for pol policy or politicians, this is, I would, I would say, very, very interesting and substantial question is, how, how to reach such a development or the result? There is only one way, by my mind, and this is to promote reforms. Reforms which should be comprehensive, which uh, should be really deep, maybe difficult, but, uh, but very, very substantial and tangible. Uh, for a good result in this area, we need to have right people on the right places. We need very, very strong and powerful management. And what is, I would say, the most important above all is very strong political leadership. Courageous one, very determined and very strong. This is my own experience. If people are asking what does it mean to have a strong political leadership, 
I mean that uh, there are three vectors of, of, uh, in, in, in this regard. The first, you need a leader who is able to build a consensus, especially if you have a government of coalition consisting of several parties. Then what is extremely important is to pass legislation through Verkhovna Rada. It means it is necessary to negotiate every day with the fractions, with individuals, with problematic deputies, because at the end of the day, they vote. And last but not least, what is extremely important is the work with media. The political leader must divide competencies to invite the main designer and co-designers of the reforms, sending them every Sunday or every Friday to TV debates with the political opponents. I have some information from Kiev. There is a lot of demagogy. If you promote reforms, this is very easy to misuse this painful uh, activity by demagogues, by populists. So you need designers who are not only well e equipped and educated, but also politically strong and willing to fight every Sunday to win the opinion of public, which is not very easy to receive. So this is the miracle behind a success story, I believe I can speak about, a success story in relations with Slovakia, maybe with some other countries uh, of Central Europe, which passed through the way from communism to market economy. Last paragraph or uh, part of my intervention will be dedicated to Russia, being inspired by the late deputy minister, but also by the real situation. And this is very, very logical. Sometimes. My friends in Ukraine are telling me, OK, but you enjoyed a better external conditions in your time. There was no recession. You didn't face a challenge of war. And um, in these days, this is different. But even under these circumstances, I feel that the reforms is incredibly important. And maybe, allow me to say, Thanks to these difficulties, people will understand that there is no gain without pain. Russia, I was thinking for many, many weeks and months what we are doing, what we are doing well, what we are doing wrong. Look, I feel very strongly that the West, I will speak the West, NATO, the EU, the West is guided by a paradigm that the Ukrainian conflict cannot be resolved without Russia. And Russia is strongly convinced that the West will not deviate from that paradigm. Therefore, Russia is very, very, very self-assured that it is only Russia who can decide whether there will be peace or instability in Ukraine. This is the paradigm in Moscow. Uh, uh, the paradigm uh, of the West. What is the paradigm is in Moscow, by my mind? I believe that Russia is guided by the paradigm that neither the EU nor NATO can integrate the country which is unable to exercise jurisdiction over all of its territory. This is, by the way, why it severed Abkhazia and Ossetia from Georgia. And this is why it doesn't want to withdraw from Moldova. Uh, in other words, I feel very strongly that uh, Russia is convinced that as long as Ukraine is not stable and consolidated, they can enter neither the EU nor NATO. So I, I, I am hugely convinced that both of these paradigms must be done away with or invalidated. As long as the West and Russia will apply these paradigms, we both, Ukraine and the West, will face a latent and exhausting conflict, preventing reforms in Ukraine, 
destabilizing Ukraine and keeping us, keeping the West and Ukraine seriously occupied. So now I can imagine the question how to ruin, to invalidate these paradigms. Very shortly, because the clock is running, I, I would tell you openly my deep conviction. Three things. The first, to step up the sanctions while declaring that they will be applied as long as Ukraine alone or with the international forces uh, is unable to acquire control over its border with Russia. This is condition number one. The second, I am deeply convinced that we should provide Ukraine with all the military assistance. I am a peacekeeper. I did a half marathon in Kiev because I love peace. But we need to be strong, you see? We need to be strong. If Ukraine is willing and calling for, we should provide the country with all the military assistance. I mean uh, military equipment, soldier training, logistics, and information. And last but not least, and I will finish with this sentence, if Ukraine will declare that it is willing to join NATO, we, the West, should declare publicly that our door is open. And last sentence, everybody in Europe should do its best to help Ukraine. But the ownership of reforms must be Ukrainian. It was fantastic when a lady behind the finish line this morning asked me when Ukraine will join the EU. I said, look, now I understand very well why I did a, a half marathon today in Kiev. I enjoyed applause and support of Ukrainians along the streets, but my race was done only with this leg and with this leg. It was my homework. And I realized on her eyes that we understand each other. So all the best for Ukraine, and I'm sure that the West and your neighbors, including Slovakia, we will, we will do our best to, to have you in Europe as soon as possible. Thank you. We have, uh, we have Jan Sweiner next on the speaker list, but may I actually suggest that since uh, Miklos is leaving us in a few minutes, if anyone in the panel would like to, to respond, comment, or, or put any questions to this. I would like to thank you for the notes and for the opinion, but I'd like also to say that Russia will go so far as we allow them to go. It's a question to us, to Ukraine, first of all. Yes, I, it's, it's for the euro, but also, I mean, that uh, together with you and European support, it's our joint target to push Mr. Putin, Russian terrorists, to, to uh, switch to and to, to, to follow Minsk agreements and Minsk, yeah, Minsk rules. And if I may add just a few words, they're not about the DCFTA, but that's about the relations with Russia. Uh, now I may say that Russians don't understand uh, the language of compromises and that's time when Europe can understand this because without this we will not manage to solve this situation and thank you very much for the support thank you yeah very very short reaction because I feel that I am really an insider watching everyday news and having consultation with Ivan Miklos who became the an advisor of your Minister of Finance and Minister of Economy last night. We didn't dance. We spoke, <laughs> we spoke only about politics and Ukraine, maybe 70% and 30% in Slovakia. Well, that's true, but we should be honest towards, towards each other. What does it mean? The first step must be done by Ukraine, and it was done, as in our case. In 1998, I won elections with a huge mandate of the population to bring the country to the West. And I hesitated no minute. In your case, I was fantastically happy 
after Maidan, when people told me, oh, we will face a war, this is bad, I was very happy. Do you know why? Because I felt that Putin lost Ukraine. And you have decided to belong to the West. Fantastic news. But the decision was yours. And I told for many times on different platforms that, that if Ukrainian boys are able to bring or to make so huge sacrifices dying in the East, we, we are obliged. You see? If you want, we should add and we should do our best to boost you, to help you. So this is politically correct. This is not against Russia. This is not an expression of hatred against Russia. This is my deep conviction that, that in this case, if Ukraine has decided, if you want the same as I wanted for my nation to be prosperous and secure, we have to do our best, and we will. We will. So, Jan, uh, a bit of maybe both academic and Czech perspective on, on the discussion. Sure, sure. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I, uh, I will give a little bit more of an outsider perspective. I have been coming to Ukraine periodically over the last 20 years or so, but, uh, but not as intensely as, as others. Uh, so, first of all, uh, congratulations on what you have already achieved. It's pretty impressive. And uh, having advisors like uh, Prime Minister Zorinda, Minister Miklos, uh, you're in great hands. Uh, so both of those sort of remind me when you read Winston Churchill's memoirs when he finally becomes the prime minister and he goes to sleep that night and says, that night I went to bed relaxed and calm. My new Britain was in good hands. <laughs> so, yeah, so very good. So, so let, let me sort of give you my perspective. I think that as difficult as the situation is, it really harbors a great, great potential. In other words, Ukraine is so way below its potential that with the right policies and the favorable environment that hopefully will be brought about, uh, the economy can grow very, very fast. Closer, all right. Uh, so in that sense, I think that's a good starting point, that if you prepare a strategy, a vision, goal, strategy that uh, incorporates this, you shouldn't be afraid. It's precisely what uh, uh, Prime Minister Zurinda said. The economy, you know, you can do extremely well, beyond expectations. In fact, your economy has shown in the past that it can grow very fast, but it's been uh, uneven, and you're going through a difficult recession preceded by stagnation for a couple of years. So, uh, but that may be the best time, actually, to formulate a very effective strategy and go forward. So in that sense, I think it's uh, an opportune moment. When I look at the situation in Central Europe uh, and uh, think of the countries that have done better than others, and what's important to realize is that while these countries were very similar 20, 25 years ago, they are very different now. So you can learn and use eclectically the good lessons and avoid the bad lessons. So that's, again, a terrific advantage, second advantage that you have that you should uh, not squander. And here, for instance, the experience of Serbia which immediately after Milosevic regime, when we were consulting there and uh, looking at the possible strategy, uh, there is a situation where for political reasons, an opportunity was squandered for a long time because they had good economies, they could learn from the first 10 years of transition and were unable to do it for political reasons. So I think that if you can avoid the logjam and deadlock that uh, happens in countries like that, to a lesser extent in the Czech Republic as well, uh, you'll do well. So I think the important thing is to prepare a good strategy. And, um, and I think there, if there is one lesson in terms of what worked and what hasn't worked, and there is obviously a multitude of factors, but the one I think that is primordial, really important, is to establish a well-functioning legal and institutional framework. Uh, so something that really is uh, widely accepted by people, it's fair, it's transparent, and there is uh, implementation and reliance on the system working. That, I think, is one of the major distinguishing features uh, that you see on the part of some countries versus others. And then the reforms have to be well prepared. A good coordination of the micro foundations to the macro level. You have both now a problem at the macro stabilization. You have micro, a lot of microeconomic issues that need to be resolved. So that, I think, as I hear you working on this and thinking about it, that's exactly the right way to go. 
A couple words on the DCFTA and uh, the association agreement. I think it's a bold uh, step and it's a step in the right direction. Uh, you have to realize that it's a major step. Um, in some sense, you're going from a situation where you have uh, uh, both worlds. You're already partially benefiting from being open to the European Union. You still have the benefit of the Eastern market, and uh, you will probably go through a major reorientation. The good experience from Central Europe is that it can be done very fast, that uh, beyond expectations, we never expected how quickly trade could be reoriented from the east to the west. So in some sense, those lessons are important and uh, use, them, use them wisely. Uh, together with it, I think, or oh, one thing I would mention since we have the Minister of Agriculture, uh, contrary to what many people think, agriculture can play a very important part. If you look in history, Canada, Australia, developed through agriculture, United States yes. to a very significant extent, Brazil. okay, exactly. So, and Argentina did not, so it can be squandered, so be careful, Brazil. right. Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but it's, it's a good lesson. Argentina should have done like Canada yes. and Australia. It was on the same path, and it shows you how uh, government policy and institutional development can go very well or not very well, depending on what you do. So I think that's important. The other part that really can play an important role in this, and another factor, is foreign direct investment, right? And you have um, had good experience with it. It's gone down to virtually zero this year, last year. Uh, you know, again, make sure that it comes, because with it comes uh, not just the direct effect, but the spillovers are positive and wide-ranging. So I think this is something that's very important. Uh, I would say that. Um, the last maybe, since I think it's important to have just few points that you know, one can focus on, I would say the other experience, and this is where Minister Zurinda and Miklos can, can give you also important advice, my experience is that one has to negotiate with the Europeans carefully and thoroughly. That uh, there can be different types of deals that can be negotiated. And you can get a pretty good deal if you use the best negotiators, the best positions, uh, if you persevere. And it can make quite a lot of difference in the way the rules are applied, the rules are set, what kind of timing you get for adjustment, and so on and so forth. And here I think it's important. I mean, you're a country that uh, uh, can reorient and is reorienting agriculture fast. Industry, of course, part of it has been uh, in difficult situation given the conflict and everything. So you should be able to negotiate relatively advantageous conditions. And in the spirit of what we heard from Prime Minister Zurinda, Europe should be forthcoming on this. There should be really a partnership in the sense that uh, uh, Europe is willing, and Europe also learned a lot of lessons in admitting the new states. So it should use wisely uh, the uh, lessons that it learned of how it can be most helpful. Right. So I think this is, this is important. Um, finally, uh, I would just echo uh, in a very brief way what, what has already been said with respect to uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. My reading of the Russian position as well as historical approach to uh, matters is that uh, Russia understands and uses strength and power. And if you are dealing from the position of strength and power, you will be respected and you will be better at obtaining results. And so therefore, if you're a strong economically country, you'll do better in other respects as well. Thank you. I think we'll also give uh, Prime Minister Zurinda a final applause and thank him for his commentary. <laughs> Time has come to uh, talk a little bit, I think, more on the business side of, of EU integration and what that means. Please, Taras. On two more, I, I think that's uh, uh, So I, I, I must say that when we are talking about negotiating with the EU, indeed, the, the, uh, the, whole, the whole history, the, the whole story about the relations between Ukraine and the EU and general relations with the EU, it's about negotiating. Even, with, even if you are already a member of, of the EU, yeah, so I think that's, I, I usually recall uh, an example that when we negotiated the agreement, in the same Borshev Duke in the next room was uh, meeting on uh, discussing the standards for washing machines, uh, and the next one about the anti-terrorist machines. Is, uh -huh. yeah. it 
worked for a second and then it stopped. Working. So maybe, okay, now it works. Yeah, okay. So, so it's, it's it's all about about negotiating. It's never never ending story. Therefore, I think that we we need to to improve our skills in in negotiating with the EU. And I think that uh, that uh, in this dimension, U Ukraine develops quite quite well. That if we make, yeah, it. So if we will compare with uh, our understanding of relations with the, with the EU in 2001 and in 2015, I think that Ukrainian government and civil servants are better prepared to negotiate with the EU now. So that's that's I, I, I'm aware of. And uh, um, uh, but we have a really big big problem in, in in our relations for the moment, not only due to Russia and about Russia, but the problem connected with let's say internationalization of our of our relations with with the EU. That we are talking like diplomats, and th this is a generally talk between diplomats in the dimension of in, dimension of international relations. In order to to really integrate into the EU, I think that we need to talk about internal policy, about infrastructure, about agriculture, about uh, energy and so on, not in terms of, let's say, external relations, but how to really integrate to Ukrainian economy to, to, to the EU. This is, I think, that one maybe technical, but uh, really like a tectonical change that need to, to, to come to reality. When uh, our reports will be read not only by European External Action Service, um, work, uh, so, uh, servants, yeah, uh, but uh, in the sectoral d directorate generals, the DGs, then I think that the Ukrainian topic will be more of integrational approach than just of foreign relations. Then I think that when uh, I, I would also uh, pay attention to the fact that when we are talking about EU integration, usually uh, I think that uh, lead, Ukrainian leaders are saying that uh, EU integration or association agreement is uh, by itself a reform agenda. And from my perspective, it is not. And we have a really good example of, of and we already discussed this with Mr. Miklos uh, uh, for a number of occasions, that when we are talking about fiscal consolidation, so this is not a part of EU key, but it is based on very technical decision on application of European system of accounts, just bringing uh, public finances into the same framework as in the EU in order to understand what the level of our public debt uh, you know, uh, and uh, other things. So when we are talking about EU integration, and especially in, uh, implementation of DCFTA, this is a really technical basis for structural reforms that need to be implemented. And here we have really good um, schedule of these technical measures that need to be implemented. And, and it, these technical measures should go uh, step by step and together with high level structural reform that are undertaken by Ukrainian government. And they should be simultaneously and complement each other and not contradict each other. And in, in only in this way, we will have success both in implementation of, of the agreement, in structural reforms and let's say Europeanization of, 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 of Ukraine. Uh, then what about business? I think that business, first of all, so we, f what, what is really good is that when we are pursuing any goal from American Chamber of Commerce represented a lot of companies, we by default use European standards as a basic of our position. That's for sure also really good uh, news because that means that business interest in developing of regulatory framework is in line with EU, with uh, uh, DCFTA, with uh, association agreement, and generally with EU uh, approach towards regulating policy. From another perspective, it appears that trade with the EU, uh, it, the, the trade with EU is the matter more complicated than we expected earlier. So it is not only with uh, how to trade, because I think that we, we have a lot of, a lot of companies uh, which already have a lot of good relations with EU markets, especially those who trade with products, the quota on which have been fulfilled in a in, in couple of weeks. Uh, but at the same time, we understood already, and we see it from uh, other companies, that one thing when you have market access, and uh, so another thing when you, have, you, you uh, comply with all standards with all requirements of the EU. Third is if you have clients. But fourth and very technical and complicated things is logistics, how to move your products for, to, 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 to the European Union. And we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of examples that switch big, uh, uh, let's say, product 
uh, flows from east to west or from from south to to west is a task of a, of exp I think it, it, one of most complicated task task in Ukraine, and we also need to go through this period of really adjustment of all dimensions and all all elements of our economy uh, to the u using of, uh, of trade 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 with the EU. And I think that the final statement uh, could be that, um, after all, so in order to understand what we should expect and uh, what, what we should expect from DSFTA and what is really in the uh, real interest of business and society in, in trade with the EU, it, it is the change of, change of state and full, um, let's say, full discovery of purely Ukrainian, Ukrainian potential. Because what we need to understand, after all, is that becoming European states, it, it, it means that you, your state, your state officials are same as everywhere in Poland, in Czech, in, in France, in Ukraine, there should be similar, similar rules. But societies and economies could be really, di really different. I think that what, what is one of the most interesting book I read a couple of years ago was book of Polish journalist about Czech society. That 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 means that po Polish people they they need a book explaining how neighboring country lives yeah, and the, the and the tradition of neighboring country. Let's learn from it too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, but that's just explain that member states of the EU could be extremely different. So different in their economic policy, in their uh, values, what what dominates more churches, atheism, and, and uh, the different traditions, and so on. That means that Ukraine will, will never lose its, its own traditions if it will integrate with the EU. It's just an opportunity to promote its unique, unique values, unique, uh, unique competitive advantages, and so on. And finally, I think that the story with Russian Federation could be really interesting, because from, first of all, Ukraine is not first country which lives through this economic divorce with Russian Federation. So it's, it's the story starting from, uh, starting from, I think, that early 19th century, so starting with division of Poland and the fact that Poland, after division, that the Polish kingdom, which was part of Russian Empire, was, has customs uh, border with Russian uh, Russian Empire and no customs border with Prussia and, and Austrian-Hungarian. Austrian Therefore, Polish Kingdom was never really economically integrated into Russian Empire. And the, this economic story about in integrating uh, Poland to Russian Empire was, was extremely interesting because it's, it was just changing from, t from time to time. Then I think that we have Baltic states, which are, from infrastructural point of view, still more integrated with uh, Russia than integrated with the European Union, because uh, there is no uh, good energy or electricity infrastructure between Lithuania and Poland, or road uh, or railway between Lithuania and Poland. So everything is possible. So that, that's also, there is no you one, you, uh, one answer to the to the question how to continue relations with Russian Federation. But I think that the phenomenon of economic development, a phenomenon of transformation, uh, could be, so a phenomenon of, uh, on its influence of transformation on trade with Russian Federation of European states could be also really interesting because for, as in, in my understanding, that the scale of, or volume of trade between Former, former communist uh, states, which are now members of the European Union, now is much bigger than it was during uh, this uh, social economic cooperation entity, which uh, tried to integrate uh, e is, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, and Soviet Union in one in one economic uh, economic circle. So, after all, now Poland sells more to Russia than it was communi communist, uh, communist country. So therefore, for Ukraine, it could also be a really chance to, to increase its uh, economic ties with Russian Federation. Of course, when this country became rational, in its, at least in its trade policy. Yeah, thank you. Last but not least, uh, Veronica, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's uh, does it work? Uh, it's real pleasure and challenge to talk a lot on this so honorable panel. So I will try maybe not to summarize, but look over. 
what was said already, and to reiterate once again that Ukrainian economy now is in very unique situation, and uh, not only because it's in a crisis, but especially because it is in structural changes. Some of these structural changes were forced because we lost uh, some of our territories, uh, the Ukrainian economy lost some of its enterprises just physically. They were either destroyed or allegedly moved somewhere. And uh, Ukrainian structure of uh, industries, structure of services, structure of agriculture is changing. Certainly the trade and exports is changing as well. And we see both uh, changes, geographical and commodity changes. In commodity, we see that we are losing uh, trade in mineral products, which is natural. We lost Donbass, we lost coal, we lost access to, to some other mineral resources. We lost access to uh, market where we bought uh, raw oil to process it. Also, we are losing metal and chemical industries to the large extent because they are dependent on cheap energy resources, which we are not having now, and also dependent on mineral resources. That means that the structure of goods trade will be very differently very soon. And now we saw very dramatic loss of exports precisely because of these structural changes. and likely never return to the previous situation. Second is these geographical changes. We have already touched upon Russia, upon EU trade. Uh, Ukraine is already uh, reoriented almost. Last year was uh, not completely, but we are losing Russian market very dramatically, and uh, we are increasing the role of EU, but importantly, not only EU, but other markets. Uh, we are talking today about EU, and I suppose to talk about EU integration, but I want to highlight that we should not forget about other markets. As Alexei already said, trade diversification has to occur to EU, to Asia, to Arab world, to Africa, and most likely also to Americas, which are a bit far away, so it will be more expensive to sell there. Because EU is very good for structuring our trade in terms of standards, in terms of assuring compliance with uh, requirements, but it should not be considered as the only panacea. Also, definitely, we have always undertraded with the EU because of these standards. If we look at the gravity model, Ukraine traded before with EU and Russia. That was natural in terms of distance, but uh, if we look at the economic weight, we have terribly under-traded with the EU, because uh, EU is 10 times more in economic wealth than Russia and the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, but the trade was very comparable. Plus, uh, so we are now reorienting, and the uh, reorientation continues, which also gives very good argument to our officials talking with Russia. The uh, Russian concerns over the Ukra loss of Ukrainian market will, in very near future, will be evaporated because there will be no Ukrainian market for Russia. It just will not buy, or will buy a very small amount of energy, which, given these change, structural changes w uh, in trade with energy and energy efficiency, energy uses, will also use much less of that. We can reintegrate, actually, Two years ago, not two, three years ago, it was a hope that Ukraine will be very greatly placed between two FTAs. FTA with the EU, FTA with Russia, rules of origin abate, trade with both. It's not happening, but, but still, we don't have Russia, but we have Belarus and Kazakhstan. Custom union with Russia, but behave absolutely differently. So we can use them as a gateway still entering the CS market. Plus, Ukraine can be a regional hub because Russia is losing its trust. Before, Russia was a regional hub, clearly. You would invest in Russia if you want to trade in this region. Now it's a very questionable. Do you want to invest in Russia? Maybe it's better to invest in Ukraine, which will have a better investment and business climate, and then to trade with all the other countries except of Russia. So, summing up, Ukraine, and Ukraine now 
going through structu painful structural changes in its trade, and but we will see much healthier, much more dynamic, much more dynam uh, competitive trade a couple years uh, from this point. But uh, what we have to do, and that was already discussed, there is, should be several dimensions, some are done domestically, this is reforms. I completely agree that uh, reforms that are pronounced in DCFT, they are not, uh, they are not structuring everything, but they given highlights what should be done and given some mm, schedule. But Ukraine is moving fast in some directions, which is positive. On the other, it should be these uh, DCFT, uh, FTA dimension. We have DCFTA and hopefully it will not be, it should not be, uh, postponed, and we are talking about Turkey, this FTA now negotiations ongoing, we have FTA with EFTA, we are talking on other FTAs. Opening the market should be key for our growth. It was, it's a very interesting, just the last remark because before discussion, uh, you know that Ukraine introduced temporary import duty to save its balance of payments for 12 months, and business is unhappy. They're saying that these import duty hurts experts because they cannot buy cheaper um, inputs. But if they are unhappy with additional increase, I am very curious why they are not crying about delaying the CFT because it's exactly the same. They are paying more for import uh, for imported inputs. It's uh, we have already can have zero duties for a lot of imports from EU, and now we, uh, we are paying, it's still paying. But it, uh, I am very happy about the, that they are crying about import to duties. It means that they are not protectionist. They want open markets. They need open markets for exports, but they are ready to open also it, its own market, to have it uh, more competitive, to buy inputs and to sell more. And I very hope that uh, in a couple of years we will see uh, Ukraine trading very successfully with the EU, with other words, and after Russia becomes rational again with Russia. Thank you. Uh, I, I will soon uh, take questions from the audience, but I, I can't help by starting to ask one question that may sound a little bit negative, but I think it's still quite crucial, and it comes back to your discussion now about trade. Um, in, in one way, Russia and Ukraine is unfortunately competing not only in Eastern Ukraine, but also on the World Bank uh, ranking of trading across borders. Uh, Ukraine uh, gets ranked at number 154 out of the countries in this ranking, and Russia at 155. So I'm, I don't want to sound critical here, but I'm, I'm wondering, is this sort of understood among policymakers here, uh, how difficult at least it is perceived it is to trade with Ukraine? And, and is enough attention focused on, on making it easier to, to trade with Ukraine? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to start with the figures. So Ukraine is number one exporter for sunflower oil, number one exporter worldwide for sunflower seeds, number three exporter for wheat and grain, number seven exporter for poultry. And when I was in case of doing business, having 96 position and having the target to be in top 50 by the end of the year. This is example that by real figures we already, we already know how to trade and we are very significant trader. 37% total export is agrarian products. 37 at this moment. And it's also, you know, somebody said it's agribusiness, it's, it's post-Soviet Union, it's not interesting. Come on, it's modern, it's high-tech so far, it's a scientific approach. We have huge potential for that. We have the, be the best uh, black soil worldwide together with Argentina. Uh, we have very nice people who would like to work, who know how to work. We have 4.8, 4.2 million individual farmers in the country. More than 50% of the production by, uh, let's say, done by these individual farmers. And having such huge potential, know how to trade and do good quality products. We work a lot on, on the safety standards. I can give example with China. Chinese and Americans, they had issue with the GMO and the quality, and now corn is not coming to the, to, to the China. We opened Chinese market, and last year we completed very difficult government D2G contract. 
And this year we're talking about how to triple the export volume to China and talking about how to double the export to Asian countries, to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, to Iran as well, for example. So we know how to trade. We are professional in that. We have huge potential for that. But the main issue, we are undercapitalized. We really undercapitalized to go see not only agrarian business, but also other industries. We're lacking working capital. We're lacking funding for machinery. We have now huge let's say, postponed demand for more than 4,000 tractors, 3,500 of modern campaigns, harvesters as well. So we're also lacking financing for irrigation system, for modern ports for facilities, for railways. That's why we're now opening for privatization and trying to attract the investments from abroad and also for local investors. So it's uh, not only one side of the coin. Let's see the whole picture. Thank you. So, so first of all, I, I would support every, every word uh, of, of, of minister because from the American Chamber of point of view, we unite a lot of uh, agricultural companies. We fully align with, with these statements that we have a huge potential. But when we are talking this ranking, you, uh, you, you quote, I think that it's, it's more about import. And this could be our competitive advantage, that, that we export more and import less. Yeah? But this is this is the, yeah this is this is a joke. So for uh, this is this is a joke. But I think that indeed the problems with our ranking for international trade that means with importation procedures is one one of our one of our number one priority in talks with development of customs customs practices because we have one of best customs code in Ukraine. It's based on EU legislation. Where to this year. This year we will have third, uh, so it will be three years after it's entered into force. We will have a big event, and we will discuss that the text is beautiful, but the practice is is awful. And we are we are we are working and no such, such no such okay no, no and and we are trying to convince our state fiscal service and uh, and uh, Ministry of Finance to uh, to implement couple of practices which will improve the situation, but. And as you know that, so that, that means that the, the work is, 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 is going on on, on the implementation of, uh, let's say, simplifying, simplifying practices on, on importation procedures. But in order to underline the, the let's say, the general assessment that we, we could be, uh, I saw interesting presentation of our, one of our members, company Lenovo, and uh, by um, coincidence, the general manager of Lenovo in Ukraine is the head of Chinese commercial. And he presented uh, Chinese approach on, on trade with Ukraine and presence in Ukraine. And they said, you are, non 90, uh, you are 96 in World Bank ranking of doing business. China is 90. So for us, Ukraine is a land of opportunity. So we, have, we see no major problems. With market with 40, 46 million people from which 60% has higher education, that means this is a beautiful place to do for, for doing business so they enjoy invest and and work and develop develop your business here so you see that the uh, let's say perspective could be really 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 different but for sure i think that when we are talking about that i think this example is really uh, explaining the problem with ukrainian with ukraine as a, as a place of of, of of an investment or regulatory framework problems that we could have brilliant laws and the problems with day-to-day -day implementation and the, this will be a really challenge for all reforms in ukraine for the next couple of months yeah. uh, i'm sorry uh, just a couple of words i fully agree with speakers but what couple more understand it. The doing, ban uh, doing business ranking is based on the assessment of expenditures of uh, average medium enterprise. We have done a study in the institute about the how enterprise are trading. The most of exporters are large enterprises uh, and small and medium are present in the domestic structure much more than actually in experts. Expenditures which are extreme, indeed very high, are related to the size of the enterprise they are facing. And also, um, I think Taras highlighted the key issue why we have this ranking. It is indeed the practices of implementation of tax code and other procedures that are just creating a very administrative but high burden on enterprises. And 
what we are seeing now, we are seeing deregulation, reduction number for licensing, switching to more of e-government, and I hope uh, see really e-government quite soon because it's crucial to move everything out of the paper into transparent electronic systems. And then I hope we will see a uh, fast uh, moving also up in this ranking. So I, uh, if, I, if I'm allowed to summarize this, that in, in some ways Ukraine is actually a, a world leader in exports. Uh, in some other dimension, the World Bank needs to really think about its uh, ranking. Uh, but maybe somewhere between there, there are still some issues with implementation of, of otherwise pretty good laws. So, uh, all right, I, we're going to leave uh, some questions. And would you like to? <laughs> no, you see, we uh, always uh, okay. We always think about legislation and pay less attention to the implementation. However, we have faced an issue of implementation, and I do think that this is the crucial point of our everyday work. Uh, because you see we can have a good leadership, but without the middle level in the ministries and agencies, we will not be managed to succeed. Because we have to prepare those who will implement then the CFTA and to work on everyday basis with business. Otherwise, we will face the same problems all way long. And this is our main point of concern nowadays, and that's where we have to work very closely with the European Union, because we definitely need a story of success. And this story of success has to be our common story of success, not only Ukrainian story of success. And we have to show to our societies that we are able and capable to achieve such a success. And that's why we put forward in front of European Union the issue of access to the structural funds, because we need to improve our infrastructure, and this is our main goal. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I hand over the first question from the floor to Eric, please. Uh, let me try to introduce a little bit of drama into this very peaceful discussion of It doesn't work for drama at all, so maybe I can use another mic. <laughs> this seems to be more dramatic. So uh, let me try to introduce a little bit of drama uh, into this very peaceful discussion uh, where, uh, in which everyone seems to agree on about everything. I come, I, I come from a country that also signed the DCFTA agreement with, uh, with Europe uh, literally less than a, a year ago, and that, that country is Georgia. Uh, the only difference between Georgia and Ukraine in regard to DCFTA is that Georgia has signed this agreement after 10 years or more of radical deregulation, which is not exactly the case of Ukraine. So we have done maybe 10, maybe more years of removing barriers for businesses to develop. And not only businesses, for people to move, for goods to, to, to move across borders. And now we are implementing the DCFTA as, as of June 2014. Now, I would like to focus on the D and C letters of the DCFTA. We all know what FTA means, so that means free trade agreement, but what does D and C in this agreement mean? So let me tell, give you examples of what Georgia is right now doing. As of September 1, number one, September 1, restrict the movement of people across borders. So now we have much more restrictive visa regulation, and also we have much more restrictive labor re regulations. So it's much more difficult now for foreigners, including engineers, farmers, agro agronomes, managers, teachers of economics, to come in Georgia and teach That's and work. That's number one. That, that's done as part of the visa um, liberalization process. Number two, it is part of it, and that's how it's introduced. Now let me tell you, it's association agreement. Association agreement. The, the other thing that is being uh, uh, done now is uh, f uh, all the phytosanitary uh, controls that we have, of which we have none. So we are in the process, this is fairly slow, of trying to, to accomplish that as well. As of, I uh, believe, Thursday of last week, the Minister of Labor has signed a decree on the initiation of labor inspections 
in, the, in Georgian businesses. So we, we, we have done without labor inspections for the last 10, 12 years. As of last week, we will have labor inspections back. Okay, this is just the beginning. There will be environmental restrictions. There will be all kinds of other things with which Georgia is not necessarily ready to cope. You know, is Georgia able to afford regulations that define the size of the cucumber to be sold in the Georgian market? I'm not sure. In the EU, it, these things are regulated. In EU, we know the growth rate at which EU, EU is growing right now. It's not exactly leading the world in economic growth. So the question is, can Ukraine sustain the same pressure? So I'm coming back to, uh, to Jan, negotiating tough on the DNC letters. Please. Thank you very much for comments. Uh, especially for Georgia, I have very many good friends in Georgia. Before being the minister, before being the minister, I spent two weeks talking with all the different parties, including opposition, about what they have done in terms of reform, what has been cut it, and what was the effect of the cutting. You know also Georgian situation that they cut it so much. I can, ex I, I can compare Georgia with, let's say, agribusiness with the cow. So they, they, they cut it the leg, they, they cut it, let's say, started some scam, but, but, this, but then they cut it the head. And cow di the diet, actually. They closed the export for more than half a year to Europe because they deregulated so much <laughs> in terms of sanitary and sanitary norms. It's, it's, it's a question about deregulation, about Georgian experience. And this was the statement from the Georgia guys. What are they doing now during the last two years? They're regulating back and they're putting extra functions back, back and back. The same thing with, with talk, talking about, let's say, helitin approach. The, you cut so fast as possible and then thinking, wow, we need to add as much as possible back. So in our case, in agribusiness, I don't want to kill the cow, means. So we would like to go step by step in terms of, and we also been recognized by our Georgian colleagues that things which has been done in the last four, four months, they did it in three, five years. We do very fast because, first of all, we have worse situation, sorry, in the East. We don't have time to wait. We have also big expectations locally here inside and huge expectations outside. If you go and see the reforms uh, which we have been pushed to do in order to receive IMF, uh, to meet IMF requirements, to receive financing, we had to do radical reform with the budget cut and also to show the regulations issue and show that we is the business. We had huge pressure from the donors, from local society, and also have work. In Georgia didn't have let's say, such conditions, and all other countries in the world didn't have such conditions, so we have to match so many expectations at once, and I am sure that we will be able to manage this and to do it, let's say, our own Ukrainian way. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want, f first of all, I'm, I might say that I, I, Georgian negotiating team used our experience, and I, I personally trained uh, Georgian negotiating team in negotiating with the EU in 2008, I think, or 2009. So that's, and I know from the very beginning the situation of negotiations of Georgia with the EU and Ukraine with the EU on this uh, approximation things was completely different. For us, it was more deregulatory things so that we have uh, more regulation. For Georgia, it was uh, absolutely different. But one example, what. Uh, uh, Minister said it is exactly the situation for, for agriculture. Georgia, with this 100% deregulation of uh, veterinary and sanitary rules, of course, that it doesn't ruin the health of society, so of, because after all, so Suluguni became the same tasty and more or less healthy. But uh, this situation led to the, to, the, to the expansion of African swine fever, which leads to total decapitalization of all swines, and which is by by the edge to uh, to avoid situation with African swine fever, despite the fact that we even didn't we, we do not control uh, border with Russia, which is also export of African of swine fe fever fever now. So that that means that sometimes bureaucracy is not so bad. That's what the EU teach all the world because the EU is the perfect bureaucracy with a number of red 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 red, red tapes. Therefore. Therefore, you should understand that that's, this, this is really good, good, good comparison in order to uh, also to explain the basic choices why you need this DCFTA. You should choose whether you should be a libertarian jurisdiction inviting foreign, foreign, foreign direct investments for, I don't know, for industry or something like that. Or you should 
explore market access to the jurisdictions which is heavily bureaucratized and you need you, you need bureaucracy ukraine in comparison with with uh, georgia always had b bigger share of export to the eu to, to europe in general georgia i i think it was four percent of it, it exports went to the eu generally it was it went nuts for for ukraine we have up to one third of our export went went to the eu and now it's so less more so it's what was fluctuating and we export a lot of a lot of things and in, in order to have a market access for day, day, uh, dairy products for chicken we need to have this bureaucracy therefore i think that the, the, there is no other option at all so y your example is really good but explaining why it is necessary Necessary. So, but for, for sure, for you, Georgian reform sometimes it's negatively because you need to reinstall a lot of bureaucracy which have been liqui li liquidated during this radical uh, re deregulation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and just a few words to add to those which have already been mentioned. I may say that we do understand that uh, European market is highly regulated. But if you want to trade, you have to follow these regulations. And we definitely have an interest in European market. That's why we are ready to implement their rules. And as for the visa liberalization, it's not definitely a part of the DCFTA as such. However, we do think that we will have a great opportunity we would establish visa-free regime because our men travel more frequently to Europe promote their products in Europe more easily. That's why we are ready to uh, have quite a tall, better migration policy, more secure documents, and the rest of the issues. And we are very much eager to have this with a free travel regime. Maybe just 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 a la verde to all this to all these our statements. <laughs> yeah, just I, I, I might say that uh, if you if you refer to the speech of minister, he, he mentioned chi trade with China. Trade with China is even more bureaucratized, and this is a matter of international trade generally. When you will follow uh, TTIP or TPP, so this uh, new uh, so currently negotiated uh, free trades uh, between US and the EU and in the Pacific, it's absolutely it's a lot of rules. It's hundreds hundreds and hundreds of pages of rules regulating international trade. So unfortunately, this, this is a global path that international trade is highly bureaucratized. Therefore, I think it's so negatively influence uh, these deregulatory initiatives sometimes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, 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 just one word. I agree with everything I would that Sometimes people sort of say tautologies like, well, pursue that's fine, but you have to always ask yourself which are the good policy or good bureaucracy. Nobody disagrees that good bureaucracy is good, but you know what, what makes it effective, etc. Those are the tough questions that you have to then, then deal with. Yeah. So, in some sense, we're back to implementation also. Yeah, and just very tiny word. For example, in TBT, we have already very good in approximately and a comparison showed that it's actually still deregulation, that Ukraine has now more difficult environment than we will have even after implementation of EU rules. Just in the TBT sphere, SPS is more questionable, but we will still will proceed with it, I'm sure. Any short questions from down there? Institute of uh, Economics and Forecasting. Uh, thank you all speech, uh, speakers, speakers for interesting discussion. And I'd like to get your comments on um, such aspects uh, as um, technological development of Ukrainian uh, economy. Um, uh, how does it deal with the uh, uh, transfer of technology, uh, increasing of innovation, and uh, after all, um, increasing of uh, high-level um, value-added uh, production? And um, if you could uh, please uh, name uh, particular steps and measures um, that is held. Uh, and which uh, could help um, to make Ukraine number one 
trade and not only in a resource market, but also um, high technology market. Thank you. Thank you very much for good question. I, I'll start from agribusiness. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can, I can give you example that question absolutely very good because with DCFT and European market, we are now becoming not the bread basket, we're becoming food basket. I was joking recently that Russia, they have oil and gas, we have land and corn, but not only land and corn. Uh, I, can, I can give you already examples that uh, we have huge interest, for example, to invest in the seeds growing market here in Ukraine. Pioneers have built one of the top three, the biggest factory in Poltava region. Kava is starting to build in, in the western part of Ukraine. Lima grain, Evralis, Monsanto. So we're becoming the part of really highly technological stuff, preparing and let's say the seeds, non-GMO seeds for the whole, for, for the whole world. It's first. Second, uh, you know, recently to, to, to uh, also big events, I don't know why it wasn't noticed, but the company Sampa has finally signed agreement with HTZ Kharkiv Tractor Factory to start production here campaigns, harvesters. From next year, they will start producing for 200 harvesters uh, actually uh, per year. It's a highly technological stuff. They're giving technology. They're not giving the people, they're giving technology. And we have huge interest from now from class, from John Deere, as well to start production here, to assembly here. It's also a good example to you. Also, we have big interest now, for example, also to also technological stuff. For example, how to modernize our logistics. We started the project how to use river, Dnieper River. In, in, in USA, in, in Mississippi, they use 55% to total transport, but Mississippi is not a good comparison. In France, they use 25% total logistics through the rivers. In Ukraine, we use less than 3% of total our logistic volume would use the Dnieper River. And it's also huge technological investments, how we see also uh, it's, it's ecological stuff because less transport would, would be involved. It's huge also economical stuff because less roads would be uh, as also damaged. But we started this project. Also about irrigation system, it's also added value and highly technological because uh, from Soviet Union times, irrigation system 82% now depreciate in the south. In the five regions of U Ukraine, we can triple, triple our yield with the irrigation system. It's also an example of highly technological stuff. So for that, we already see huge benefit of opening the borders and as being internationally transparent and also with DFTA in European Union. Thank you. I, I would just, I fully agree with it. I would add that uh, in addition, there are sort of two important channels. One is the foreign direct investment. So you'll find that a lot of the advanced technology is capital embodied and comes into it. Uh, contrary to expectations, it can actually lead to major increase in employment as well. Because very often the companies will use local production in a worldwide <laughs> supply of chain and so on. So that's, that's important. And it has human capital as well, both among the managers and skilled workers who then move across in the economy. So I think don't think. Some with the multinationals, you can negotiate a special deal where they will do R&D in the country as well. Very difficult because there are economies of scale and they prefer to concentrate relatively few places, but it can be done. There are exceptional uh, circumstances like Intel opening a plant in Costa Rica. It's actually very instructive. Costa Rica was not on the map at all. They were looking at four locations in uh, Latin America. The Costa Ricans submitted a proposal to them where they essentially said we'll provide a special zone right next to the airport, special supply of electricity with no fluctuation in the current, and uh, they won the competition. And the effect on the economy has been tremendous, not just in direct production, everything, but entire young generation of people are studying to be engineers, technicians, and so on, just by that one simple example. So sometimes there are incredible possibilities of this kind as well. Just to, I think that first of all, what uh, just just to add that agriculture could be extremely innovative. That's that's what what I I would add that we have a lot of industries which. Uh, seems not to be innovative. Usually when we are talking about innovation, people look about IT and some other things, but our, uh, let's say, strong uh, strong uh, branches of economy could, could, could also be innovative. I think that we also have the American Chamber of Commerce. We, uh, we work together with Minister of, of, of Health, for example, on, on improvement of pharmaceutical markets. 
and we see examples from other jurisdictions that by improving the regulatory framework, you you invite a lot of R and D into 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 the country. It's it's not only about international companies; it's also about local companies. And sometimes the key problem, and when we are working talking about, for example, pharmaceuticals, the problem with uh, exporting innovations or promoting innovations is once again in a regulatory framework. And not only in regulatory framework, but also in international deal, deals on, on acceptance of this regulatory framework. Because we have a number of domestic pharmaceutical companies which have unique innovative pharmaceutical products which they cannot uh, uh, place or market uh, to, to any foreign country, especially the European Union, because we, we, are not, we have not, no agreement on mutual recognition of uh, pre-trial pre or laboratory, uh, laboratory checks. Therefore, it is too expensive to go second time for any laboratory checks and the, all, all these investigations for pharmaceutical products. But if the agreement, DCFT agreement is implemented fu fu fully, it will re extremely cut costs on, on moving our innovative products to other markets. Therefore, that this could be a good example how how this DCFT can promote. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm not only one of the uh, organizers; I'm also the timekeeper of this event. And I know that some of our speakers have other commitments to deal with here. So I I would just like one more time to thank all of you you for being here today and. Of course, our speakers for coming here and, and giving us all, all these uh, interesting news. Thank you.